throughout the whole of the movie, the idea that you're going to be judged for what you've done is a theme in the movie. And so this one little clip scene continues the theme of the movie. I'm Ryan, and this is Lutheran Lemonade. Cue the music. This drunken little German monk. Eh, sometimes. Not really, though. He's intoxicated with himself. Yeah. Sober him. Light now, Francis. I'm Ryan, and this is Lutheran Lemonade, weekly theological podcast where we sit down at the kitchen table to talk about theology. Lutheran Lemonade, to gladden the heart of man. Now, if you've seen the title, obviously you know what we're talking about today. We're talking about the movie Run, Hide, Fight. And so you might be asking yourself, why do you have a Bible in front of you, Ryan? Why do you have the Lutheran confessions in front of you, Ryan, if you're talking about a political movie. Well, we're talking about it because it's not a political movie. It is just a good movie. And so we are going to talk about one particular scene in that movie and give it kind of a theological review just to see how the secular world does when they engage themselves in theology. So where can you find Lutheran Lemonade? Well, um, once I get all the, the I's dotted and the T's crossed, you can find all the old episodes on anchor.fm slash Lutheran-Lemonade. Uh, plan is to have those up on Thursday evenings moving forward. And of course, every Friday, you can find Lutheran Lemonade right here on the YouTubes at youtube.com slash 1517 films. Just look for the circle with 1517 in it and the word films below and you found it. Lots of entertaining stuff there contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. So if you're new to this YouTube channel because you're interested in the movie Run, Hide, Fight, and you just want to watch another review, maybe consider subscribing to the channel, ringing the notification bell, seeing what else the channel has to offer. Um, it does look like most of the views from the channel do come from those who are not subscribed. So I would highly encourage you to do that so that you can see what content is coming in the future. So before we talk too much about the movie Run, Hide, Fight, maybe if you haven't seen it, uh, if you're just watching, you know, you're normal to my channel, you, you're used to watching my stuff and you have no idea what Run, Hide, Fight is, let's take a look at the trailer and please, Daily Wire, don't ding me for copyright infringement. I'm promoting this movie. So let's take a look at the trailer and then we'll talk about Run, Hide, Fight, the concept of uh, conservative cinema, the theology of the scene that we're going to dissect, and then, of course, we're going to talk about the importance of quality Christian cinema and what Christian movie makers can learn from Run, Hide, Fight. So let's watch the trailer. In between breath, take the shot. You done really good out there, kid. Size of that deer, we're gonna be eating venison all summer. Well, the day's work. I think we need to see somebody again. And by we, you mean me? No, I mean us. Hey, that look in your eye. Guys in my unit had that look. You think there's a brochure you can hand me so I can go? <laughs> all of that is true, by the way. Is that Chris Jellick over there? Is he doing something completely weird? Senior prank day. But we'll see all kinds of dumb stuff today. Swim captain, we'll have Thai food delivered to class, and Becky Vaughn will set up her homemade slip and slide. This is high school. Nothing that happens here matters in the real world. Okay, we are in charge now, so please pull out whichever app you use to do live streaming video. Get them up and running and point it at me. Now! Get down on the ground! Any more friends back there? I'm calling 911. Get back to your homeroom and stay put until the... You must be close. Be a shit. 
very disturbing news out of Vernon Central High School. Zoe. In between breath, take a shot. Go! Is it safe to say that this might be our guardian angel? Do you want more people to die? That's the last thing I want. I'm gonna kill one person in this room every five minutes. You don't show your face. Isn't it ironic that after all your hard work, people aren't gonna remember you? No? They're gonna remember me. Yep. Run, hide, fight on dailywire.com. Now, that's how you're gonna be able to watch it. So, if that trailer looked interesting to you and you have not seen the movie yet, I think it's worth the money to, to subscribe to the Daily Wire to watch that movie. Although, obviously, clearly, we're not watching it with our children, especially because they're young. We send them to school, be it private or public, and maybe it's just not for them. It is an R-rated movie. It does have graphic violence in some scenes, and it does have occasional vulgarity and even the slightest bit of nudity. So definitely not for the children. So as the, as the trailer says in the beginning, in an active shooter situation, you do have three options. You can run. It's a viable option. You can hide. Circumstances dictating that might be a really good idea. Or you can fight. Now, I'm not in a position to tell you whether or not in a situation like that you should run or you should hide or you should fight. Heck, I don't even know what I would do in a situation like that. But what I do know is that when I set foot outside of my door, I am prepared to fight. Now, if you are thinking maybe you should be prepared to fight too, uh, or at least prepared to defend yourself and the ones you love, my advice to you is this. If you're going to conceal carry, that's great. It is your God-given right as an American protected by the Second Amendment that you can keep and bear arms. You can defend yourself. But if you choose that, my recommendation is, and it's going to be tricky these days, Get as much trigger time as you can. Buy up some ammo. Go to the range. Practice shooting. Get used to the weapon. Let them train you. They're, they're experts and professionals at most at all almost all shooting ranges. I'm, I'm sure there's a handful that probably aren't. I've never gone to those ones. But get that trigger time. Get your adrenaline going. Do some push-ups or something. Get that heart racing really fast and then try to hit center mass on the target. You can't just buy a gun, holster it, <clears throat> go out into the world, and expect that you're going to hit the target and not an innocent bystander. But enough about that. I'm not telling you to conceal carry or not to conceal carry. I'm just saying that even though I don't know what I would do in an active shooter situation, would I run, would I hide, would I fight, I am prepared to fight. Now, this movie is put out by The Daily Wire. Now, The Daily Wire is the fastest conservative New, the fastest growing conservative podcast in the country. And they have crossed over into me media, entertainment, <clears throat> not just political commentary. So their first movie of choice, Run, Hide, Fight. Clearly a sensitive topic. School shooting always is a sensitive topic. I was first introduced to the idea of school shooting when I was a junior, senior, somewhere in there in high school, and I went home and watched all about Columbine that day on the news. Um, we're familiar with it now. But what this movie does, <clears throat> excuse me, that's different from what the leftist media does is this movie simply tells a good story. It has quality actors. It has incredible acting. It has practical effects instead of cheap computer CGI. And it tells a dynamic story. It doesn't preach. And even in the scene that we're going to dissect in a minute here, <clears throat> so sorry, it's not preachy at all. The scene happens. The story moves on. That's how it, now it does take a couple of pop shots at real issues surrounding the problems 
with school shootings. It addresses the need for fame and notoriety. It addresses the problem of current plans that are in place to keep students safe. But it doesn't preach about these things. They are present in the story. And it's up to you to decide how you feel about it. They're not like leftist movies where they're forcing an agenda down your throat or they have to have a quota of certain demographics represented in the movie. Otherwise, it's going to be shunned. Now, this movie has indeed been shunned by the critics. It's up to 25% from critical review on, on Rotten Tomatoes. And uh, the, the viewer review of the movie is 98% on Rotten Tomatoes. It tells you everything you need to know. And that's why the Daily Wire got involved with it. Because they want to just make quality content. Their stance is <clears throat> people watch movies to be entertained, not lectured. And Christian filmmakers... I want you to hear what I said. People watch movies to be entertained, not lectures. For the love of God, do not make a God's Not Dead 4. Please don't do that. The brothers involved with making Fireproof and War Room and God's Not Dead 1, 2, 3, and a billion, they need to sit down and stop making these dog shit movies until they figure out how to tell a good, compelling story with quality actors. Kirk Cameron needs to retire. He can't act his way out of a paper bag. But before we get <clears throat> too into the negative, because I don't want to get into the negative, we're going to discuss the positive. This is an incredible movie. I've watched it three, four, five times already. It's just so good. And it really gets you thinking. But we're going to dissect a scene from the movie theologically because I had my gears spinning for about two days after this scene thinking about it, is this right? Is this true? Is this an accurate representation? Taking into consideration that this movie was made, uh, as we'll hear uh, later, by someone who's not active in the church. So it's inspired by faith, but is it faithful? So we're going to take a look at one scene from Run, Hide, Fight, and then we're going to go to our Lutheran confessions, and above all else, the scriptures. And they're going to say the same thing. <clears throat> That's what I love about the Lutheran Confessions. So let's watch this scene, and then we'll go from there. Sit! Hmm. Yes? You believe in God? Yes. Huh. Now, why would God let something like this happen to you? Oh, man. It just mirrors it hot in here. Free will. God allows the wicked to do their wickedness. Oh yeah, why is that? So they can be judged. Channel 5 just interrupted their programming. They're warning viewers about graphic <clears throat> content because they're about to air the live stream. Hot dog. You got the con. Okay, we need more bodies, so we'll be right back. You two are coming with me. Move. All right. So that's the scene. Now, I let... It's about a minute and 41 seconds long, the clip that I played, and I let it go. Uh, there was stuff in the middle that could have been cut. There was definitely some stuff at the end, but I was looking for a natural place to kind of stop it. But the actual moment that we're going to critique, seconds. And what's dynamic, what caught me about the question is not why would God let this happen, which is the typical atheist, if, if God real, why bad things? That's the typical Neanderthal atheist mentality. If God real, why bad things? This question is intellectually different and theologically different, and I like it much better. Why would God let this happen to you? 
you believe in God. Why is God letting this happen to you? And maybe we don't know because he clearly gets distracted by whatever else he's doing in the movie. And no spoilers for me. Maybe he would have killed her for her answer. Maybe he had every intention of shooting her. I don't think so. Because his plan for his body count was markedly different than just killing random people. But it's within the realm of possibility that he could have shot her for her answer. So the question, why does God let this happen to you? And her answer intrigued me. As a Lutheran, it intrigued me. Her answer was free will. Now, as a Lutheran, that can be, I suppose, kind of a triggering phrase. Because Lutherans, we're used to engaging in the argument of um, you can't make a decision for the Lord. You can't accept Jesus into your heart. You know, God chooses you. God saves you. God makes you alive. You know, God redeems you. The act of salvation is from God to us. And so Lutherans, when we hear free will, we, we're kind of triggered. So that's why I pulled out my faithful book of Concord to see... What do Lutherans believe about free will? Not what's my opinion of free will, because it should never be that. As a Lutheran, it should never be what's my opinion. It's what do Lutherans believe, teach, and confess? Does that line up with scripture? Where can I go to find all the things that Lutherans believe, teach, and confess that do actually line up with scripture? Well, I can go to the Book of Concord. So I have it open to the Augsburg Confession. We're going to start with Article 2. And then we're going to go to Article 18. We have to start with Article 2 first because it's important to understanding and contextualizing Article 18. So Article 2 of the Augsburg Confession on Original Sin. And this, now Original Sin is a triggering concept for the Evangelifish, but let's just read what the Lutheran Fathers had to say. Our churches teach that since the fall of Adam, Romans 5.12, all who are naturally born are born with sin. Psalm 51, 5, that is without fear of God, without trust in God, and with the inclination to sin called concupiscence. Concupiscence is a disease and original vice that is truly sin. It damns and brings eternal death on those who are not born anew through baptism in the Holy Spirit. John 3, 5. Our churches condemn the Pelagians and others who deny that original depravity is sin, thus obscuring the glory of Christ's merit and benefits. Pelagians argue that a person can be justified before God by his own strength and reason. <clears throat> and that's a really simple explanation of Pelagianism. And then there's soft Pelagianism, which is just like heresy light. But <clears throat> so original sin is important to understand because our nature... We as human beings are sinful by nature. We're sinful from the moment we're conceived. And we have concupiscence, this inward inclination to sin. And that inclination is itself sinful. So we are sinful to our core and our inclination is to sin. And if we as Christians, like many evangelical denominations do, downplay original sin and engage themselves in, be it soft or full Pelagianism, although they don't know that's what they're doing, they're downplaying the merits of Christ that were, want, that, that were applied to us by his sacrificial work on the cross. The less of a, of a sinner we are, the less of a savior we need. The more we are honest with ourselves about our sinful nature and the depths and depravity of it, the greater a savior Christ actually is. So it's important to understand original sin because original sin, our concupiscence, our inclination to sin, our natural born lack of fear and trust in God and our inclination to sin affects the concept of free will. So when we go to article 18 of the Augsburg Confession on free will, this is the best explanation that I could find. Our churches teach that a person's will has some freedom to choose civil righteousness and to do things subject to reason. It has no power without the Holy Spirit to work the righteousness of God, that is spiritual righteousness, for Quote, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. End quote. 1 Corinthians 2.14 The righteousness is worked in the heart when the Holy Spirit is received through the Word. Galatians 3, 2-6 This is what Augustine, sa Augustine says in his 
Hypnosticon, is that how you pronounce that? Book three, quote, we grant that all people have a free will. It is free as far as it is the judgment of, uh, I'm sorry, I screwed that up. It is free as far as it has the judgment of reason. This does not mean that it is able without God either to begin or at least to complete anything that has to do with God. It is free only in works of this life, whether good or evil. Good, I call those works that spring from the good in nature, such as a willing to labor in the field, to eat and drink, to have a friend, to clothe oneself, to build a house, to marry a wife, to raise cattle, to learn various useful arts, or whatsoever good applies to this life. For all of these things depend on and depend on the providence of God. They are from him and exist through him. Works that are willing to worship an idol, to commit murder, and so forth, I call evil. End quote. Our churches condemn the Pelagians and others who teach that without the Holy Spirit, by natural power alone, we are able to love God above all things and do God's commandments according to the letter. Although nature is able in a certain way to do the outward work, for it is able to keep the hands from theft and murder, yet it cannot produce the inward motions, such as the fear of God, trust in God, chastity, patience, and so on. So, as human beings, from a Christian biblical worldview, do we have free will? Yes, we do. In things below. We have to discern between things above and things below. We have to discern between temporal and eternal. In, in, in temporality, we have free will. I chose to put this shirt on today. I chose to wear my glasses so I could read. I chose to do this video. So we do have in things below, in this world, free will to choose to do things. But where Christians get wrapped, or, or Lutherans get wrapped around the axle, is when free will is applied to the concept of salvation. And in that regard, we don't have free will. Our will is bound to our sinful nature and our concupiscence, which is our inward desire and inclination towards sin. So our concupiscence keeps us from choosing God. Ergo, no, you did not make a decision for the Lord. He made a decision to, for you. No, you did not give your heart to Jesus. Jesus gave you a new heart. Just as Lazarus could not bring his dead body out of that tomb, it was the call and command of Christ that raised him to life. And the first fruit of being raised to life, if we want to use that analogy, is that Lazarus walked out of the tomb. But Lazarus walking out of the tomb was not Lazarus raising himself from the dead, was it? Just food for thought. Now, the last thing that she said, and this is where we're going to turn to the scriptures. God allows the wicked to do their wickedness so that they can be judged. Is that biblical? We turn to Matthew chapter 13 with the parable of the weeds, and we begin at verse 24. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said no, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at, the, at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. Now Jesus later on in Romans 13 will go on to explain this what this parable means. So Jesus' explanation of the parable, beginning uh, in verse 37. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the close of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the close of the age. 
the Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let them hear. Now, a bit of geographical context here. The, um, the weed that is probably being referenced in the parable is called bearded darnel, which is botanically very, very close to wheat. And so as it grows, are you really going to be able to tell the difference? So in pulling up the, the weeds too early, Jesus says you could uproot the wheat and I don't want to lose the wheat. I do, Jesus says, I don't want to lose those whom I have sown. So let them grow together. But certainly at the end, at the harvest, when it is painstakingly clear, when all chances have been lost and it's judgment day, it is clearly discernible between the wheat and the weeds. And he will send his angels to gather the harvest. And the wheat remains in the barn. And the weeds are thrown into the fire. So at the end of the world, when we are, all of us, wicked and righteous, raised in our bodies for all of eternity, then the harvest. And those who are in Christ, those who, who have been seeded and planted by him. Notice, notice, notice. Did, 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 did the, the, the wheat choose to be planted or did Jesus plant it? Jesus is the gardener. The son of man is the gardener. And the, the wheat is, are, are the, 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 those in the kingdom. So the, Jesus is the one doing all of the work here. And so when we are all gathered together at that final moment, because... As he would say, he knows his sheep and they hear his voice. It's painstakingly obvious which one's the wheat and which one's the bearded darnel. And the bearded darnel thrown into the fire. And our, our modern ears might not comprehend the concept of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, maybe we know weeping, but gnashing of teeth means you are grinding your teeth in frustration at yourself. You are frustrated with yourself for all of the times the word had been proclaimed to you and you made the conscious decision to deny it. See, this is the tricky thing of the Bible. Salvation is a gift from God given freely by him through the, when the work of the Son is applied to you by water and the word and the, the word empowered by God the Holy Spirit. As the Bible says, um, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So you, those wicked, those who are actually in the end revealed to be weeds and not wheat, they will be thrown into the fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, where they will grind their teeth in frustration with themselves that they have ignored the gospel. And now this is, this is eternity for them. So this is why we then as Christians go out and preach the gospel, right? Because we don't want this for anyone. We don't want them to be weeping and gnashing their teeth. We want them to be um, shining like the sun in the Father's kingdom for all of eternity. So does God let the wicked do their wickedness? Yes, he does. And she's absolutely right. They will be judged for it. I think modern mega-Christianity I think the little non-denominational churches and the little Baptists and the, and the little, little, little evangelical Christians, I think they're pretty good. But the mega churches, the Joel Osteens and the Joyce Myers and the T.D. Jakes and all of these, these heretics, these wolves in sheep's clothing, they tell us that every, every day is a Friday and God wants us to live our best life now and you got to name it and claim it. And, and then you get T.D. Jakes saying crazy stuff like, um, we existed <laughs> in eternity before we were born. <laughs> and of course, he denies the doctrine of the Trinity. So mega Christianity is telling you a false gospel that you are to be healthy, wealthy, and prosperous. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. But we take heart because he has overcome the world. Jesus says he lets the weeds and the wheat grow together for the sake of the saving of the wheat 
He patiently endures the growing of the weeds so that at the proper time, at the harvest, they will be dealt with, they will be judged. Now, what do um, Ben Shapiro, uh, uh, an Orthodox Jew, and the writer of Run, Hide, Fight have to say about this one scene? They did this long hour and a half um, premiere of their movie, where they didn't actually premiere the movie, but it was insightful to watch, and they did talk about this scene. So let's, let's take a listen. Uh, there was one scene that popped out at me, and that's the scene where um, Tristan is asking uh, one of the girls uh, who's religious about free will, and she drops a little sermon about free will. And I thought, that's something you will never see in any of <laughs> Like, really, you're not going to see it. I mean, yeah. that's, a, that's a, the, the point that she makes about free will, where she says it, that bad people are allowed to be bad people so that they can be judged. Now, uh, that is as good a 30-second explanation <laughs> of free will from a religious perspective yeah. as I can imagine. And it also is a theme running throughout the film, which is you're going to be judged for your own behavior mm -hmm. and that you, you're going to need to be held accountable for, for that behavior. So I, I thought that that was, it's, it's a beautiful and, and I think will be an underappreciated scene because it's yeah. kind of off the beaten track of the yeah. film, right? It's not the, the conflict between the main characters, but it really is wonderful. Ben, the scene that you mentioned, I, I, I'm, I attend this men's, spiritual men's group in Los Angeles and I'm like the youngest member by like 30 years. It's really interesting. <laughs> uh, and that, that got brought up, you know, basically why does God allow uh, bad things to happen to good people got brought up one night and, and one of the guys was like, free will. And I, I didn't fully understand the conversation, to be honest. So I, uh, my wife is religious. I am uh, I'm not practicing any religion. I came home and I said, what does this mean? <laughs> Can you please explain the world to me, honey? And she was like, oh. And she's like, I think, yeah, she basically just dropped that line on me. And she's like, God allows uh, the wicked to do their wickedness so they can be ju judged. And I just like, that's going in verbatim. And <laughs> I almost fell over. Um, <laughs> But I do, it annoys me that even though, you know, I, I was raised as a Catholic, uh, my dad uh, didn't attend, you know, my mom would kind of drag us every Sunday and I'd, I'd be like, I want to be whatever dad is because he gets to mow the lawn and stay home. I want to do that. <laughs> uh, uh, but it annoys me that Hollywood is, they have forgotten that this is a religious country completely. They're, I mean, if you put religion in a script, I have seen that, uh, Drew, when you were mentioning like, oh, that's taboo. But why, why is the... Uh, even though I'm non-practicing, I'm starting to kind of revisit the Bible and be like, uh, there's a ton of wisdom in here and some mm -hmm. amazing uh, ideas and quotes and things that now are inspiring me that I'm kind of approaching it on my own. So that is a lesson that Hollywood could learn to kind of mm -hmm. revisit some of that stuff. Not only is that a lesson that Hollywood could learn, I think there's a lot in here that Christian movie makers could learn. What did Ben call it? A little sermon. It, it was... Three statements, and it was done. And as Ben Shapiro pointed out, it actually fit. Again, spoiler free, really, truly. But throughout the whole of the movie, the idea that you're going to be judged for what you've done is a theme in the movie. And so this one little clip scene continues the theme of the movie. And unlike a Christian movie where it's a sermon with bad actors and poorly written characters... And unlike that, this movie has compelling, well-written, well-developed, complex characters excellently portrayed by top-notch actors, and they tell a good story. So Christian movie makers, watch Run, Hide, Fight. Take notes. This is how you make a good movie. If Christians made movies of this caliber then Christianity could potentially stand to engage the culture. Because that's what Daily Wire is doing. They want to engage the culture. They don't want to change the culture per se. Well, of course they do. But, you know, hearts and minds kind of. But they're engaging and acting within the culture. And they're not compromising their morals. They're not compromising their beliefs or their standards or, or their political ideologies. But they're looking at a movie and going, why do people go see movies? Well, they want to be entertained. Christians, you, you make movies and you say, um, what, what sermon did my pastor preach uh, this past sermon series that the rest of the world who won't come to church needs to hear? So we'll just make that sermon into a movie. 
That is a piss poor way to make movies. It's <laughs> so Christians, we need to be better. This is incredible. And if given the choice between Pure Flix and The Daily Wire, well, I've already made my choice. My money is going to The Daily Wire. I am paying The Daily Wire for content like this because it is the highest quality and the highest caliber that there is. So Christian movie makers, we've got to step up our game, don't we, as Christians? We've got to make better movies because Christian movies, by definition, are substandard. They are not good stories with well-written, well-developed characters. They are sermons that you heard preached at your megachurch and you think the world needs to hear it, so you're going to turn the sermon into a movie. Unlike this, where it was a brief 30-second sermon that actually carried the narrative all the way through, the narrative of the movie all the way through, the theme of the movie. 30 seconds. This movie does not preach conservative God, guns, and ammunition. It doesn't preach that at you. It just tells you a compelling story based on real things that happen in reality and shows you how people choose to react. So, Christians, you've got a long way to go. But as far as our theological review, wrapping this up here, I think she gave a good answer. Free will. God allows the wicked to do their wickedness so that they can be judged. So, dear, dear, not every atheist, not every atheist out there, because there are some actually um, intelligent ones with with critical thinking skills, and, and they don't go for the seemingly low-hanging fruit, and I like those atheists. But for the dumb Neanderthal internet troll, if God good, why bad thing? For you, why does God let bad things happen to good people? None of us are good people. We're all stained by original sin. We do not fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Hence the reason he had to give us the first commandment, you shall have no other gods. Because we do not fear, love, and trust in God above all things on account of our concupiscence and our original sin, our free will in things below is tainted by that original sin and that concupiscence, which makes all of us bad people. The Bible says we are all, by nature, objects of wrath because of our original sin and our concupiscence. But... The grace and mercy of God, especially out of this parable, is that he has sent his son into the world to redeem the world. And for the sake of those that he has redeemed, because he loves those that he has redeemed and he wants them to endure to the end and be gathered together with him, God is patient with evil in the world. But the day is coming, O ye wicked. For you will be thrown into the eternal fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, repent and believe the gospel. And if God can raise the dead to life, he can turn the weed to wheat. Come, be grafted to the vine so that you may live eternally. What did you think? Have you seen Run, Hide, Fight? What did you think of the movie? Leave me a comment in the comment section below. What did you think of my theological analysis? Do you think it's on point? Do you think there's other places in the Bible that we could turn? Let's take a look at our Bibles together. Leave a comment below. Until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.